Peace and greetings to you. This is Amuna Yisrael, affectionately known as the First Lady of Debate Talk for you. I have enjoyed coming to you week after week, you know, season after season, growing together, speaking about the difficult topics, investing the energy, time, and effort with our brothers and sisters on the panel. Today, I would like to come to you with an opportunity for you to invest in something that I've been working on and that's near and dear to me. It's called the Yummy Cottage. You can learn more about it at www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. We're currently fundraising so that we can get it off the ground and your help would be appreciated. Once again, www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. Check the link in the box and hope to hear from you soon. Brother B.A. Ben Abraham, Yo. and I'm your host of the Man Up segment on the Big Talk For You platform. The objective is for all brothers from different walks of life to come together, link up, and build on matters concerning all various stages of life. If anyone would like to reach out on concepts and ideas, you can reach Brother B.A. at Radical Ryan. 1984 at gmail.com again radical rhyme 1984 at gmail.com tap in let's build shalom shalom don't touch that dial you're now listening to the big talk free radio What's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to Season 8 of the Big Talk Free Radio. I'm your host, Sal Showtime, and we are back with another classic show for you guys. Well, once again, we are back. I appreciate the listening audience out there that's tuning in on social media, on Facebook, checking out the show. Do me a favor. If you're on Facebook and you're inside a group, checking out the show. Share on your personal page. Let people know that the Big Talk for you is live and on the air. And make sure you attach that calling number, which is 319 527 Six two three nine. Today's show is entitled "The Camouflage of Sin and Confessions of Iniquities." Once again, today's show is entitled "The Camouflage of Sin and Confessions of Iniquity." This is going to be a Bible study right here on on the Big Talk Radio. So, like I always say, get your pen and pads ready. Make sure you take down some notes and make sure you call in if you have any questions or comments. Due to the high volume of various special guests that we have on the platform and various segments, make sure you take down your notes and make sure you call in if you have any questions or comments. Only rule that I have is that you got to keep it clean. you got to keep it professional when you call in. Believe it or not, we have people listening, they're listening with the kids and even the elderly. Well, without further ado, let's introduce my special guest, Brother Moses, is here. Welcome to the show. Peace. Thanks for having me. All right, Brother Moses, what's going on with you, man? How you feeling? I'm good, man. You know, just managing a lot of uh, responsibilities, but all together, I'm good, man. Good, good, good. No complaints. No major. All right, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So we're about to get this thing started. Like I said, family, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. Brother Moses, take it away. Sure, peace. Um, so, yeah, tonight's uh, study is going to be called The Camouflage of Sin and the Confession of Iniquity. Um, originally, this study was done probably about 10 or 12 years ago. I uh, presented it uh, to a buddy of mine who was uh, in Atlanta at the time and uh, wrote him a letter and put the study in there, something that was on my mind and heard and I had been examining it. And uh, he enjoyed it and was like, yo, man, you need to teach. Now, people who, who know me or have heard of me, I uh, spent the last probably 10 years down in the D.C. area, but originally from uh, Buffalo, New York, part of the Knesset, uh, the KOJ. Um, I don't teach publicly much. Um, I'm not normally doing other activities around in the background, uh, either projects I got going or whatever have you. So if, uh, there's been a few people who constantly ask, look, man, can you put something else out there? Uh, and I don't do it often, but, you know, time will come. I'll be doing more writing and more publishing. But this particular study, uh, the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity, is taking a look at the process that carnal mind goes, the carnal mind goes through when it comes down to uh, camouflaging sin or hiding or concealing the activities that they have got into. You normally see this behavior uh, introduced with children, uh, at a really early age, you know, they do something that they shouldn't do. Their first tendency is to pretend as if they don't or didn't do it. Uh, if if 
a person isn't mature, that behavior still appears in them as an adult. Uh, And then you even have on a larger scale, whether governments or corporations or or municipalities or public officials who get into that same type of behavior where on a corporate level you have McDonald's, let's say, who, you know, they got all these straws that's polluting the waters and then they got turtles that's getting uh, plastic straws stuck up their nostrils. But when you see a McDonald's commercial, you don't see nothing like that. You know, it's the, the burgers, it's the fries, it's the family that can't live without it. You know, they poison in the earth on one end they showing you another image on the other hand. And this is how sin is concealed. This is how it's hid. And because it's away from the public eye, most people don't do the due diligence and don't come across all of the details that happen in the backdrop. Again, in the congregational setting, uh, you know, down in the D.C., Maryland area, you know, we'd be having Bible studies, whether up in Buffalo or in other places that I've been to. you got 50, 60, 70, 80, or even a few hundred people in the congregation and the way that the ministry is often set up is people attend a fellowship, generally speaking, and this is general because uh, I don't I don't go to everybody's fellowship, so I can't say how it happens everywhere. But generally what happens is people congregate in the public building, they sit down in a chair for a few hours, they eat some lunch, they sing some songs, and you really never know the details that's going on in a person's heart and their mind and their life because it's not put in front. And every now and then something services because the scripture also says whatever is done in dark going to be coming to the light. And, again, this is really about the camouflage of sin. So how the carnal mind, whether on a large scale or a personal scale, begins to camouflage that sin and try to remain it hidden or try to blend in to deceive those who are around them. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures uh, around that. Uh, I'd like to give... Thanks and praise to the Almighty uh, for just giving me a breath of life and the opportunity to, you know, see another day. Uh, thanks for Brother Sal for inviting me on. I know you call me from time to time or email me asking about doing something, which uh, I'm grateful for a platform that uh, this and other platforms, but uh, I'm grateful that, you know, you open the doors up. Um, so, again, as we go through, uh, I'll pause at a certain point and see if anybody has any thoughts, ideas, questions, or what have you. But again, we're looking at the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. So whether you're parenting a child, whether you're a, a child being like, you know, a, a toddler, a five or eight or ten year old, a teenager, or even if you're in a relationship uh, with your spouse or family relationships, people have the carnal mind specifically has a tendency to hide his error and cover his transgressions and, and with the, the manifest intent that it is not widely known. Right, that's what the carnal mind does. So when one has something that they normally did wrong, they're normally embarrassed by it, if they're embarrassed, and they have a desire for others not to know, and then you know they may feel ashamed about it, and through that shame of it, they begin to hide it. And we're going to look at a couple of texts that revolve around that, and see how the scriptures encourage us not to behave in that manner. Um, so last thing I want to get into is the definition of camouflage. So I chose this particular word because if you study the military and you watch military teams go into uh, combat, you generally don't want to be wide out in the open. So when you watch the military, whether the Army or the Marines or the Navy or combat troops, they generally don't wear all white. They don't wear bright orange. They don't wear lime green. They don't run neon red or yellow. They wear something to conceal the very apparel that they have on so they can infiltrate into an area and not be discovered, right? So to conceal or to camouflage specifically, camouflage means to to conceal or disguise by camouflage or by blending in behavior or artifice designed to, de- to deceive or to hide, to conceal with the means to disguise. Same principle, if a person had a fake $10 bill or a fake $100 bill, it's not going to look unsimilar to the real thing. A fake diamond or a fake piece of jewelry is not going to look unsimilar to the real thing. It's going to look really, really close to the real thing, and it's going to blend in 
So out of a stack of a thousand twenties, you may have six hundred of them that's fake. But if it's blended in real well, person just go along counting and you know, it's camouflaged. And again, this is how the carnal mind operates when they do something wrong. To conceal, uh, a lot of people may know the definition of it is to prevent disclosure or recognition of, to be placed out of sight, to hide. And again, this is the process that the carnal mind finds himself into when they have done something that's an error. And I'm going to assert that from the time that we open up the book of Genesis, that this theory presents itself. Now, different people have different beliefs about the book of Genesis. Um, I'm under the impression that there were no people talking to a literal snake that's that's my understanding of the text. There were no people eating an apple, which, you know, most people who study the Bible know that, and that's nothing new. Um, but what they actually did was, from my understanding, they consumed some information, and information, like all information, can be used two different ways. It can be used for good, and it can be used for evil. So if you take chemistry and the knowledge of chemistry, you can use it and cook up methamphetamines and distribute them across the East Coast and build a drug empire like Pablo Escobar or, you know, whatever drug czars or lords did that. Uh, or you can take the knowledge of chemistry and you can cure diabetes. Diabetes is still knowledge, it's still information, but how you use it depends on the heart of the individual and the intent of the individual. So my understanding of them walking into the Genesis account People, yeah, I totally believe that it was two people. But I also believe that the mind and that serpent, if you would, represent the consciousness of mankind. And that consciousness can convince a man to deceive himself into doing something wrong. And I think that that's where the times a lot of battles are fought in the mind. Another example is uh, Yeshua said, be wise as a serpent, right? Well, why? Is a serpent considered wise because of the way they move? They try to conceal themselves. They move back and forth. They sneak up on their prey. They camouflage themselves. And if you watch some of the creation of animals that attack their prey, they always try to blend in with the element. The tiger, the lion, they try to blend in. The snake, they try to blend in, and then they sneak up and attack. Uh, and that's that's what people do in the terms down to uh, when it comes down to like the camouflaging of sin. So I believe in the bear sheet or in the Genesis. This is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who were presented an alternative to the instruction uh, that they were told. They in their mind they said, well, you know, there's another opportunity. If you look into the Hebrew wording of it, it seems to carry the thought that when uh, Eve was presented, and she saw that tree that was desires to make one wise. It seemed to carry the thought that she can make her own decisions independent of what her husband and what the Almighty instructed her to do. So that independent ability to make a decision, like I don't need your support. That was the thought behind it. So notice that when we go into Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start there, and I'm reading out of the uh, King James Version for anybody who's reading along. There's other, you know, versions or texts that I use sometimes, but I'm reading out of the KJV. Genesis chapter 3, and I'm starting at 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know, in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall, know, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good for evil. Whatever the serpent informed Eve was exactly, partially true. They did become as gods, knowing good and evil. So they took this information and in some cases, the same thing that people do today, because I'm going to partially assert that those trees, the book never said that the trees were put away out <laughs> out of man's sight in the earth, so to speak. So I'm going to assert we still have access to the tree of knowledge, if you would, allegorically speaking, of good and evil. To this day, people still use the same information 
and use it in both ways. So people who introduce the sex, again, you can be introduced to it and run a prostitution ring with prostitutes from the East and West Coast and import them from Asia if you desire. It's information on how to deal with women and manipulate the body and make them feel a certain way. You could take that same information and start a committed relationship and get a family, right? And the knowledge of sex, it works both ways. So what was presented here was the knowledge of good and evil, and she was instructed, look, don't even bother with it, but we see that that's not what she chose to do. I'm skipping down to verse 8. And it says, and they heard, and I'm, and I'm reading, I'm skipping over, you know, whatever uh, portions of verse uh, 6, let's say, but I'm picking up at verse 7. And it says, the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Almighty amongst the trees of the garden. So again, I'm making the first statement that the carnal mind come to the knowledge of doing something wrong, and sometimes they don't actually have to know the law per se, the convictive conscience, which is like I believe that for the most part, mankind is born with a conscience of something. And some of it is societal and the society trains you in your conscience. But here they heard the voice of God and they hid themselves. Why did they decide to hide? Again, because the carnal mind knew something was wrong. We did something we wasn't supposed to do. Not again, this may be something plain that most people understand, but I want to articulate it because when you work inside of ministries, when you work inside of groups, when you work inside of uh, cities and governments, you see people moving in a certain way that when a skirt is lifted off, or when the umbrella is pulled back, it's a lot more to the picture than what is often seen at face value in public. And I think that we would do well to know that more often than not, you have many people trying to camouflage and blend in. Like, hey, man, I worship Yahweh too. Or, hey, man, let's look at that a little closer and see if that's the case. So they heard the voice of God. They hid themselves. And this is what we want to focus on that they heard his voice and they hid themselves. They also made aprons. And in verse 9, it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? Well, before, he was always public. He was always in front. He walked, they had conversations, however that manifested itself. But there was no hiding going on. From the moment that sin entered in, there was a need to conceal, hey, I got to hide now. Something isn't right, right? And this knowledge of sin produces that. And you see the same thing in infants. And I, I'm asserting that not only is it an infantile mentality and a childish mentality, it's a carnal mentality. You get a kid who stuck his hand in a cookie jar, crumbs all over his mouth. Hey, who, who ate the last two cookies? It wasn't me, but, you know, the evidence is all over the face. Well, the reality is, the carnal mind want to camouflage and say, no, nah, it wasn't me. I didn't do that. Well, the proof is that there's evidence leading back to that. But the mind, the carnal mind wants to hide themselves when they do iniquity. And again, this happens on a local level, on an individual level. And again, it happens on a broader level, right? When you have uh, accountants who are cheating on taxes, you know, they tuck numbers away and blend numbers in with other numbers and, okay, we're going to take this this plane or this jet we brought and if we parcel it off into 70 different accounts and we break it down, it just look like we didn't really spend that money. You have teachers and preachers and, and, and religious institutions who rob the people blind, but they present it like, okay, well, you know, here's the spreadsheet with all of the funds in it and this is what's happening. But the reality is when you look more in detail – and you have somebody who does financial audits or whatever have you, you go through the process and say, no, it's actually more to the picture than this. But the carnal mind, again, my point is that they want to hide themselves and conceal themselves. We jump over to Genesis chapter 4. We see the same thing repeats itself. We're going to look at, it, at that kind of quickly. Um, Genesis 4, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 6. And this is after Cain had got angry with his brother. And in verse 6 it said, And Lord said unto Cain, 
Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked to his brother Abel, and he rose up and slew him. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is thy brother Abel? And he said, I knew not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And then he went on to make pronouncements against Cain. Again, notice the carnal mind. Confronted, hiding. Confronted, camouflage. Put out in the open, look, I got to conceal this. I'm not going to say I did this. Well, again, this, you deal on, he, he dealing with the creator here. He knew exactly what was going on. You look at Acts 5, you see the same thing with Ananias and Sapphira. And, and it's a practice that I generally hold. And this is just a personal thing that I generally hold. Uh, specifically dealing with my children. I got uh, two children, one getting ready to turn 13 and one to 17. But it's a practice that I generally hold dealing with staff members or people that I deal with. Generally, if I'm asking a question, generally, I, I kind of got the answer already. Hey, man, did you do such and such or did you tell somebody such and such? And maybe I got a recording of you saying it. Maybe somebody sent me a clip of it. Maybe your teacher told me. Maybe I already watched you and checked all of the evidence. So I kind of got it dead set as a fact, but I'm going to ask and see if you're going to confess this or not. And when people say, no, nah, man, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. Oh, okay. And then you begin to ask questions and find out that in order to tell a lie, often questions, you got to conceal it with another lie and then do another lie and another one to the point where you can't keep up with the stories. But the reality is you see the same thing with Ananias and Sapphira, where the apostles already knew what they did with the monies. They already knew how they were swindling the community of God. And when they asked, they was confronted, and they made up and feigned like it was something different. Why? To camouflage that they had did some type of iniquity. And again, when you start dealing with enough people, specifically in, in the you know, in the religious realm or the, the biblical realm or you, even in the social realm. And you, know, you may discount the people that you work with because, you may it's not they in the world. They're already liars. Uh, but when you start dealing with the people of God, so to speak, people in your church or religious circles or Hebrew circles or whichever have you, when you start dealing with them closely, you begin to pick up on this tendency where people consistently find themselves in error which all men going to find themselves in. And it's not whether you're going to find yourself in it or not. It's how you're going to deal with it once it happens. But the carnal mind, again, no, nah, it wasn't me. No, nah, I didn't do that. Or one practice that I see people doing, specifically dealing with the scriptures, is, you know, claiming ignorance. Well, I don't, I don't think I say that, or I don't believe that I'm supposed to do all of that. Well, that's a way to camouflage your son. That's an easy way. Well, I, don't, I didn't come to that understanding yet. Oh, okay. Since you didn't come to the understanding, how about you not do it at all just for safety's sake? But people don't come to certain understandings and go get themselves in a bunch of foolishness and then say, well, I'm going to checkmark the ignorant box. Well, that's not cool. That's not cool at all. And one reason that it's not cool is because the Almighty searched the heart. And when people heard his search, he knows. I mean, I can kind of generally test it by asking some questions. And, you know, you see people dancing around like they got the cane on and they got the top hat on and they dancing around the questions. When the reality is, look, man, my heart just wanted to do something evil. And if that's what you want to do, man, just say, look, man, I was trying to do something evil. Just wanted to get my evil in one or two times. and But I know it's wrong, though. But. Again, another mechanism that folks use is, well, I, I didn't study that year. I didn't come to that conclusion yet, or I didn't know. Again, the whole modality is to camouflage sin. Moving on, we're going to look at Numbers chapter 5. So in the book of Numbers, the Torah is lining out uh, thoughts on dealing with the people, and dealing with the nation, dealing with the unclean person, dealing with the priests, etc., and in Numbers chapter 5, it speaks and says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, When a man or woman shall commit a sin, in, or commit any sin that men commit, 
and do a trespass against the Lord, and that person be guilty, they shall confess their sin, which they have done. Again, this is what the scripture is asking to be done. If they commit a sin, they should confess their sin, which is done. But notice what Proverbs 28 and 13 says, where the person that covers their sin, or they're involved in some wickedness, they say they're not going to prosper. This is what the scripture is telling us. So while the Torah and the other texts are telling us, look, confess your sin. Now, what would have happened if Cain confessed that he killed Abel? Well, I don't know if his punishment would have been any different. I don't know. But the reality is is that the, the confession should be made. Sometimes the carnal mind doesn't want to confess because they begin to think of what the other person is going to think and what the punishment is going to be. Just in a scenario recently with a young man who I asked a question straight to his face. Nah, man, it's, it's not like that. Okay, when I ask, I come back and double check again, and I come to discover I've been told a lie straight to my face. Well, oh, oh man, I got a problem with that. Well, I thought, you know, I thought you was going to say this. How are you going to think for me what I'm going to say in response to you just telling the truth? Don't think for me. And I don't think we should often think for the creator, but I also don't think we should be involved in things that are opposite of his will. So let's look again. We see that Adam and Eve, when they did something wrong, they hid themselves. We see the same thing with Ananias and Sapphira. We see the same thing with Cain and Abel. We look into the uh, King David when he went out and did something crazy. The first thing he did was, hey, man, why don't you go home and sleep with your wife? And, you know, the brother like, listen, man, we at war. And he wasn't even of the same nation, apparently, because he's like, yo, man, you think I'm going to leave my people? Nah, I'm staying right here with y'all. Why are you telling this man to go home and sleep with his wife? Because apparently he already understood, man, laying with the woman, got her pregnant. But, man, if you go home and the brother go lay with his wife, then maybe he'll think it's his seed trying to conceal, trying to camouflage his sin. This is the carnal mentality. It's something that we should always be on alert for, something that we should always pay attention to, not only just in other people, but also in ourselves. How many times have we been confronted with something and whatever it is? I mean, sometimes I listen to debate talk for you, hear people debating, hear people discussing something, and somebody bring out a scripture that the other person know very well is the exact opposite of what they was making. And they want to dance around in a circle, dance around. Listen, don't bear false witness. If you agree with the man, whether you totally agree with 99, disagree with 99 other things he's saying, in this case is the individual right then let's go with the fact that the individual is right because that's what the scripture testified to. But again, it's the carnal mind. They want to camouflage it. Nah, 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 this brother, because he teach such and such. Well, listen, man, there's a whole bunch of people who may teach something that's opposite of what I believe, but when I build with some people, I'm like, man, this brother hitting on something. And me, I deal with folks who believe all different types of things in the Bible. And when they're talking about something that I agree with, I concur with them and I let them know. Because, again, you don't want to be in this state of mind where you're hiding from the truth of the scripture or even hiding from the truth that's being presented to you at all. But, again, what I'm asserting, again, whether you're dealing with an individual level, a collective level, a corporate level, uh, people in government, this is even children, the carnal mentality is high. You do something wrong, high. You, you did something evil, high. You wouldn't commit a fornication or some type of sin? Hi. You stole something? Hi. Why Why do all this? And the ideal is that they want to protect themselves from being discovered. And again, I'm asserting, again, that's the carnal mind. And we know that the scriptures say that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. And it can't be friends with God. And that's the, that's the mentality of the world. So I'm picking it up again in Proverbs chapter 28. This is Proverbs chapter 28, and I'm starting at verse 13. Notice what it says through the mouth of the prophets. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So again, what happens if you cover your sin? What do we mean? Well, you commit some type of sin and you want to tuck it under the rug. Oh, no, let's not even talk about that. That was two weeks ago. That was a month ago. That was a year ago. Well, one thing that we come to find uh, dealing with the community just through the years is even if it was a while ago, 
it's almost like, you know, one brother would say, I think Brother Judah would say sometimes, you got to pull it off like a dirty scab and cleanse it out, right? So, yeah, it was a while ago, but that's what you did, though, right? You did commit some type of sin two years ago. Now, the fact is, maybe we just now found out in 2018, well, you did that in 2013. And if it's something that's egregious or some type of atrocity, no, we're not sweeping that under the rug. And you see the same thing today, and I'm just giving an example, not whether he innocent or guilty, but the the actor Bill Cosby has been accused, actor and activist Bill Cosby has been accused of stuff that happened years ago. Years ago. Why are they bringing that back up now? Hey, man, if he's guilty, they trying to, like, okay, whether it happened years ago or happened recently. If it was wrong in their eyes, they want to discover it. And some people may get into the technicalities and statutes of limitations, and I'm not here to necessarily discuss that. But the reality is in dealing with the people, specifically the people of God, you got to have a clean slate. can't be out doing all type of sin and all type of iniquity and expect not to be discovered. And the easiest thing is Proverbs is saying, just go tell on yourself. It's easier that way. The, the creator show mercy on you that way. Hey, man, you know, raise your hand. And, and people don't do that. You know, sometimes you get into the midst of the congregation, people say, well, I'm not going to say nothing. No, nah, man, if you're doing something evil, go tell somebody. Because that's how you get help, right? But if you want to hide it, you want to conceal it, it's just going to go worse and worse and worse. And then some people get into, you know, I'm so ashamed what they don't think of me. Right, what the heck you think I'm going to think of you when I find out anyway that you've been faking for three and a half years, for four years, for five years? It's going to be the same result, right? And it's probably going to be worse because I built up this thought that you was you bopping along, walking along like me. You know, and I often say to people, it's the difference between a costume and a uniform, right? Costume, people pull that out a couple times a year, Halloween, so to speak. Uh, you know, they go to a little party, they put their costume on. But us who are doing this, us who wear the uniform, look, man, day and night, we trying to walk without blemish. Uniforms mean you're being trained. It's a brotherhood. It's a preparation. You think about this all the time. You train to react the way that you carry your weapons of warfare, the mentality that you walk in, the camaraderie that you walk in, the way that you deal with people. But those who wear the costume, again, catch somebody in a, in, in, in a, I think a comedian or something said, you know, you run up to somebody in danger. So I ain't a policeman. I just got a police uniform on. What would that look like? Because, again, different between a costume and uniform. But those who got the costume on, they show up to Sabbath class. They show up to class on Sunday. They sing songs. They do Hebrew just like everybody else. But they got a costume on. And it looked like the real thing. But they faking. They're faking. And they will be discovered. And just know, and I'm not saying anything personal about anybody. I'm just talking about the process of people who camouflage sin. And come to learn through some of my own errors. And, you know, I just thank the Almighty. I've never really been caught in, like, major folly. Like, some people are like, man, I heard that you did some old wild, crazy stuff. Like, that. Just, I just don't have, you know, in the, the number of years that I've been doing this, I don't necessarily have or have had that reputation. People may say I may say stuff to rub them the wrong way. You know, I may talk mean sometimes or maybe I'm moving in a certain motion sometimes. And But, you know, some stuff... Just I, I thank the Almighty. I just don't haven't had it on my plate. But if it was, the idea to be, look, man, come confess. Raise your hand in the middle of Sabbath class and Bible study and prayer line and say, look, man, look, man, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been messing up, man. I've been messing up. I've been doing something. And go tell folks, because you can get healing that way. But again, you got folks walking around. And they, they fake it, and not even just in the religious, you know, church circles or whatever, but they're going around and they're faking and they are not being authentic. They are not being uh, genuine, but they're continually to parade around like they're doing the right thing when they're not. So, again, Proverbs is telling us, if you cover your sin, you will not prosper. Notice the book of Psalms. And then, uh, if you don't mind, Sal, we're going to, we can pause after a few more texts and then uh, see if anybody got any thoughts or questions and I'll take it back. I don't know how you normally do that, but, you know, I'll, I'll open that option up and then jump back into some more text. Uh So I'm going to the book of Psalms and I'm going to chapter 32. Again, we're talking about the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. 
And this is Brother Moses giving the uh, lecture today. And I'm making, and generally, uh, I'm talking about the process in which the carnal mind follows when they have done something wrong. And we looked at uh, the Genesis, Adam and Eve, when they did something wrong. We looked at Cain and Abel when they did something wrong. When you start getting to the government of the Pharisees and the council, when he was often approached by the master, and he asking them about this, that, and the third. They running and ducking and hiding. He asked them a question. They asked him a question. He asked him another question. So, well, we we can't even answer that because if we say this, you gonna say that. They hiding. They playing games. They camouflage. They're trying to blend in and say, well, we just not even gonna answer at all. But it, that's not being sincere, and it's not being authentic. And what actually happens is that stuff begins over the course of time to crumble like a stale cookie or something. Uh, Genesis, oh, sorry, Psalms chapter 32, and I'm looking at verse 1. It says, blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whom spirit is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through the roaring all the day. The day and night, the hand has heavy upon me, and my moisture turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So notice, apparently, the way that David, or the writer of the Psalms, was carrying it out at first, he was expressing, blessed is the man or the person whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins is covered. How do you get your sins covered? And they, it is not going to be by hiding your sin. And this is what it begins to lay out in verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wax old as though roaring all the day long. So it's almost, to me, looking at this text, as I think Jeremiah said, when I decided to shut up, it was like fire in my bones. And David is saying, when I kept silence, when I wasn't saying nothing, it was paining me. Then in verse 4 he said, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. Now again, most of us should know whether we're dealing with a relative or a spouse or we said something some, you know, sideways at, at work or said something that we should not have said to a person. If your conscience is trained, and when I say trained, I'm of the belief that you have to have a convictive conscience. I don't believe that the conscience just works. I think you have to have a convictive conscience, and you have to train your conscience to be convicted of certain things. So I'm of the belief that if your conscience is trained and you do something that you should not be doing, then your head and your brain and your mind and your emotions is real heavy, and it continues to bother you. He said, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. So if he was, you know, uh, let's say sweating or he was uh, full of energy or, or, you know, let's say that waters, living waters was in his belly, so to speak, then it turned into drought. Why? Because he was, he was holding back that confession that the creator was looking for. But in verse five, it said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Well, how did you get forgiven? It was through the confession process. And until mankind, or womankind, if you would, continue to camouflage their sin, until they stop camouflaging their sin, they confess their iniquity, or they sin, they're still going to be dirty. It's still going to be held over them, and it won't go well with them. In Psalms chapter 51, he repeats the same thing. He talked about acknowledging his sins. And he said, you know, cleanse him from the secret sins. And again, it's the process of being clean. It's the process of being reproved. And I have come to learn through the years that it is often better that the individual who have done something wrong bring it out. Better it happens that way. Than, it, than if it was discovered. Because when you discover, people get to be embarrassed and squeal in the chair and they begin to act all type of ways outwardly because they just want to stay in hiding. You know, they just prefer to stay in hiding. 
Um, if you would, I don't know the normal format, so I'll, but uh, I'll pause here for a few minutes to see if anybody got any thoughts or questions, uh, or if you want, I can keep going. No, whenever you're ready, we can definitely can go to the audience. You know, we like going to the audience out there. If you have any questions and yeah. comments in regards to this topic, The Camouflage of Sin and Confessions of Iniquity is the title of this show. That number to call in is 319-527-6239. So, Brother Moses, whenever you're ready, just let me know, and we'll open up the phone lines. Uh, so we're going to do that now. We're going to take some calls. And also, family, you can send me some emails at debate talk for you at gmail.com. That's debate talk to number four and the letter U at gmail.com. For those who don't want to necessarily call in but still have a question, I'll gladly read out your question to Brother Moses. But let's go to the first caller. And by the way, if you're new to the show, there's no foul language. You got to keep it clean, keep it professional once you call into the show. But believe it or not, we have people that listen with the elderly and with their children. Let's go to 716 541. You're live in there. Uh, thank you, Sal, for uh, taking my call. And um, I would like to say to, to Brother Moses, I really appreciate the way that you are reading the scriptures, the way you're breaking it down and giving the analogies, because it's a real problem, you know, regarding the scriptures, because most, when they do read it, they want to look at it carnally. And the scriptures say that he made it real plain that a fool need not err. Now, that verse that you just read in Psalms, that was very clear. He said that if you confess your sin, it said that God is faithful to forgive right. you. Okay, but man is not going to do that. And they, and, and, and it, it just amazes me. You know what I mean? The, the Bible, the spirit, you have to look at it spiritually. You can't do it kindly. And you, you, you really breaking it down and the analogies are great. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Yeah, you're going to add some words if you want to, if you want to respond. No, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think, uh, as I expressed before, just, you know, studying through the years, I initially, I wrote this study out years ago and presented it to a brother who was uh, in Atlanta at the time. And, uh, I think I sent it to him in a letter, and when he when he went through it, he called me back and was pretty excited. But I, you know, I, I I was excited when I originally did it, but um, I think I've only done it once or twice since then. And uh, we talking this was if it's 2018, let's say this was 07. Um, but you know, it's something that I'm I'm revisiting, uh, looking at, and it, it does seem to change. That again, the more I deal with people, especially you know, you deal with people who are just coming into the word and, you know, you start keeping Sabbath and feast days and we laugh and joke and we hanging out and, Hey man, we all the same. And then, Whoa, you know, Whoa, 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 Whoa. We ain't no use over there doing that. That, that's, that. that shouldn't be done. And maybe they knew it the whole time. But, uh, the reality is, is yeah, the people got to confess their faults and it's embarrassing. It's belittling. It causes you to be humble because when you got to go tell somebody that you, have either done something wrong against them or you've done something wrong against the Almighty and you just need support, that's not that that hurts the ego to the one who's arrogant. Like because maybe people thought that since you were sitting here with me for the last four months that you was blameless because maybe I thought you was blameless or however it go. You know, I think the carnal mind and the mind in general it plays a lot of tricks on people. It deceives people a lot. And it's really incumbent upon us to tap into what you were just saying, the spirit. Really tap into the spirit because the spirit will help us reprove and say, you know what? Go tell somebody you did wrong. And that's sometimes that's hard to do. That's for the carnal mind. I mean, sometimes it's hard in general because you're thinking, well, maybe they're not going to accept me. Can I ask another question? Um, yes, you read a passage. You read a passage in, in Numbers where it was talking about how you confess. Now, in that passage, it tells you what to do. Did it say that you're supposed to be stoned? Oh, so I didn't read the whole passage. I really just pulled out the confession part. Um, and in well, general, I understand it. Yeah, I have to go back and look at that text specifically. But in general, um depends. Like people, my understanding of people being stoned, they were only stoned. 
at the hand of two or more witnesses and only for specific things. And it wasn't, you know, you just couldn't have a free reign on stoning people. Uh, I think that's, and I'm not saying that you think that, but people say it. People tend to have a tendency to approach the Old Testament like that. Like they were just throwing rocks at everybody every time you look around. I mean, if that was the case, we probably wouldn't even have a New Testament because everybody would have been dead by then. But protocol for stoning people and uh, that, that putting someone to death wasn't taken lightly. But um, I think in that, uh, looking back into. Yeah, I think it goes into making restitution and adding a fifth part to a trespass. And I'd have to get into the details more of it. Um, I have to look back over and get into details more. But the, what I was pointing out there was mostly that if a person committed trespass, you know, and they know they're guilty, they need to confess it. Yeah. He said, yeah, one and more some of them don't understand that. Is a difference in a transgression and iniquity is a difference, right? Oh, um, I think they're the same thing. I think the, the scripture uses them, uses them interchangeably. Yeah, the transgression and the commit iniquity. I think the, the text uses them interchangeably, but I could be wrong. I think they use them yeah. interchangeably. Well, yeah, with the transgression, you say, oh, I made a mistake. I'm going to repent. I'm not going to do it again. Now, iniquity, you just live in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I had to look at that. I don't. I don't think I've looked at it like that. Um, yeah, but I had to look at that. That might be but a good no, point. You, you, you're doing a great job. Wow. Thanks. Hallelujah. All right, once again, it's debate talk for you, family. That number to call in is 319-527-6239. We always have a lot of special guests on the platform, so whenever you hear somebody of interest and you have any questions, feel free to call in or if I ever hold your peace. Once again, that number, 319-527-6239. We do have a social media uh, comment slash question here for you. It says, it's clear that people, it's clear that people that try to hide sinful acts do so why because they're ashamed of what they did how does one overcome that hidden shame within oh good question um i would say two different things and let me look at this uh this text here uh i would say two different things one is that um people have to look at or should whether they have to or not is subjective but people should look at the ultimate point of confessing their iniquity and what are they trying to do? So if you commit some type of atrocity or some type of uh, sin against the creator, um, shame, if your conscience is convicted, accompanies the sin that you commit. And I'm saying specifically if your conscience is convicted. Now, if your conscience is not trained, it won't do anything to you. So, for example, uh, some people who understand uh, certain parts of the Torah uh, during the Feast of, let's say, uh, matzo or unleavened bread, they would take leaven out their house. And some people say they're only going to take parts of it out their house. Well, some people don't even think nothing about that. They're like, look, man, I'm about to eat snacks and bread and go out and eat pancakes at the restaurant. Like that, that doesn't bother me. Like I don't, but if the conscience is trained and it accompanies with a certain sorrow for doing something like that, uh, there's a teaching that I go through sometimes during the feast days, just about the process, to, you know, the process that people go to cleanse their house out, which the process is you have to find the sin, just like you have to find unleavened bread or find, let's say, bread or whatever, whatever got yeast or what have you in your house. Same process, right? Same way you got to find sin in your life. Well, what is the thing that I'm doing wrong? So I think that's the first thing. What's the point of bringing it out? The point is that you are being made whole again. That's the point. But you can't do that, I don't believe, if you don't have a convictive conscience. If you don't believe that what you're doing is wrong, then you're not going to take any steps to correct what's wrong. But I think that, for me, I have to train my conscience in what's wrong. And I think that that helps you. Uh, second thing I would say, uh, the first point I'm making out is to train the conscience. 
The second thing I'm going to point out is in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read shame and sorrow interchangeably. So if you hear sorrow and I say shame, or if you hear shame and I say sorrow, I'm using these words interchangeably. So I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm reading in verse 8. Uh, Again, process, right? So it says, for though I made you sorrow, or let's say shamed, with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle that made you shamed or sorrow, though it were but for a season. So he wrote this letter, and let's say people was acting a little vile or crazy, and, you know, Corinthians people was doing things they shouldn't do. He wrote them a letter. They felt some type of way about it because it convicted their conscience, and it bothered them. And he said, well, because I made you feel like that way, I don't feel bad about it. Verse 9, it says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrow, but that you sorrowed to repentance. So if, and I'll, I'll give an example, and people, you know, People don't necessarily like this, but there's a preacher in Philly, one of my favorite preachers, uh, Geno Jennings. And again, you know, you know, you're not necessarily like a Hebrew or nothing like that. So people may like, why are you talking about him? He sometimes call people certain names, like, you know, women dressed like this, they whores, or people done like that, they adulterers, or they fornicators, or they liars, or these preachers, they dealers, or they false prophets. And for the person who wants to be right, in the sight of the creator, if they hear something like that, they're not really offended. And he's really not going to make them sorrow if they want to do right. Right? So I remember somebody coming to me and saying there's something that they did wrong, and I was really offended that they did something wrong, and I tried to make them feel worse about doing wrong because it wasn't necessarily me that they offended. It was they sinned against the creator. So, yes, you should feel sorry for that, and I shouldn't feel sorry for making you feel sorry. or feeling shamed. But in verse 9, he says, now again, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you're sor- that you sorrow to repentance. So for me to provoke somebody to repentance is the aim. So if I call you a biblical name that, you know, maybe you may not like, and it provokes you to repentance, then hallelujah, I have done my job. But if I scorned you, down to the point that you thought you couldn't recover from what you did wrong, then I can be in error. So I think it's a delicate balance. But how do you do it? First, I think it's having a convictive conscience. You know that, look, I done wrong. And the point of me fessing or even training my conscience is that I'm self-pricked when I do something wrong before it gets to me even having to come confess. And I've done something like way left that I need to confess about. So most of us would not stick our middle finger up at our mother. Most of us wouldn't use vulgarity or slap our mother. Most of us wouldn't disrespect our mother. Most of us wouldn't walk into our mother's room or our parents' room when they were undressed because our conscience is trained not to do that. But for the person that don't care, they would do it. And if you even did it by accident, the conscience bothers you enough. So if the conscience is trained the right way, it produces that godly sorrow and it can also produce that repentance. Um, And I'm saying that this is the same thing that the elder was laying out in Corinthians, that if he made you feel sorry and it caused you to repent, then good. He said that you might receive damage by us and nothing because you were made sorry after a godly manner. But notice what he said in verse uh, 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. So you shouldn't be ashamed if you were made to feel ashamed and it caused you to straighten up your act. But he said, but the sorrow of the world worketh death, or the shame of the world. I'll give another example. During certain times of the year in New York City, and they do it in D.C., because I, you know, I halfway live in D.C., half up in, in, in upstate New York and Buffalo. But during certain times of year, you got men who love men who will walk down Fifth Avenue or Pennsylvania Avenue with thongs on and kiss each other, claim that they're proud to be gay. They conscious don't bother them, right? 
They don't feel ashamed to do that. But then you may have a person who don't really keep the whole Sabbath or say, you know, oh, I got to work on Saturday or they don't wear a fringe or they don't keep certain parts of the dietary law or they don't love their neighbor as they self or whatever the thing. that. But they constantly ain't even trained to be convicted. So when they do something foul, they're like, well, God understand my heart. So I think the way that you, and Sal, if you can repeat the question one more time, but the way that you overcome that is you know that you're trying to be restored whole, right? And all of this is for the better for your walk with the people and with the Almighty. But if you can read the question again, just to make sure I was answering it. Yeah, we'll read that uh, social media question again. And again, that number is 319 527 Six two three nine. I see we have a lot of people on the phone line checking out the show as usual. If you have any questions, simply press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. Uh, the question again is: It's clear that people that try to hide sinful acts do so why? Because they're ashamed of what they did. How does one overcome that hidden shame within? Right, and I think the, the overcoming is the support of the people that surround you, knowing that they're trying to provoke you to good works. So again, I'm reading Second Corinthians eleven. I mean, 2 Corinthians 7, I read verses 9 and 10, and I'll read 11. It says, Behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, uh, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, and what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. And in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So I think that he's clearly pointing out here that when he provoked you to shame, like, again, I got a lot of probably examples to pull from, but you know, I'm working different capacities, right? So one of the things I do is run a consulting company, my wife and I, and peace to my wife, Samaria Moses, who sent me this study electronically because I'm down in D.C. and I thought I had it in my, my MacBook, and I didn't. So she sent it to her, hallelujah for you, and my daughter, if she's listening. But, um, I'm sitting in a meeting with a young lady one time, and her shirt is cut so low that it's just embarrassing to be sitting in front of you. You know, and it's like, listen, man, I came to meet with you, not the twins. And when you say something to the person that is of the right mind, it provoked them, and they go put something on and cover themselves up. To the other person, ooh, you know, they want to, you know, stick their chest out a little more. I mean, that's, look, that's arrogant. Like, let me stop the meeting until you can dress appropriately. Because personally, I just don't want to be sitting in a meeting with you like that. Personally, I just don't care for that. Um, and I, I say to analogize it, you know, I don't bring my private parts to a meeting. I think it's, I, I think that's inappropriate. But if a person feels convicted by that, then what they will do, and this is what uh, Corinthians seems to be saying to me, it says when they were reproved or when they were made shamed after the godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in them. So they became much more considerate and mannerful of the things that they were doing incorrectly. They said, we're clearing in yourselves. We're indignation. So then you began to even be upset about the thing that you did. And how do you revenge your disobedience? You revenge it through obedience. So, yeah, man, I used to dress like that. Yeah, I used to do that. Man, I remember me and uh, brothers, you know, uh, Elder Judah, Elder Tim Zeta, we'd sit around – class years ago and we just be reading as many scriptures this is early years you're talking back in the you know late 90s early 2000 hearing somebody committed adultery and we sit around scaring ourselves what happened with adulterers why because man we want we want to be clear that none of us should ever be caught in that and we want to have even indignation against sin to the point where no nah, man i should never have that named among me so I think one of the things that you do is you build up that convictive conscience, but you also know that whoever is whoever you're confessing to, or even if something that you've done, uh, everything is not a sin unto death. And I think the uh, prophet James or the apostle James say that you know in some sins it's not unto death. So you know again I've never and I don't know what the caller or the, the person saying it. Certain sins I never got into, so I never got into no homosexuality. I ain't never got into no illicit drug uses and doing. I did my fair share of evil stuff, but anything that the person have done, they can repent from. 
You know, you got Rahab who was a harlot. She can repent from that. She can recover. Moses killed a man. David committed adultery. Point is, you confess that, you can repent for that. You can recover from those things. So I think that that's the modality that we should carry, knowing that if we convict ourselves, we have a, a, a sharpened conscience, it does well for us. And if we don't, and we shame to confess our iniquity, uh, well, uh-oh, the world going to think something negative of me if I got, you know, long skirt on or if I tell them I keep the Sabbath. Okay, yeah, all right, see how that works out for you. See how that works out for you. But yeah, any other uh, questions or callers at all? Yeah, I see we have another social media question. But again, family, that number once again is 319 527 6239. We have a lot of people listening via phone and via Skype. If you're listening on Skype, you can press number one, and that lets me know if you have a question. Of course, you're on the phone line. Just press number one, and that'll let me know you have a question as well. You know, here's some of the things that you're bringing out, Brother Moses, and reading the title, The Camouflage of Sin. You know, it brings my mind to the term that people use narcissist. <laughs> you know, one that lacked empathy, uh, and people oh, yeah. that, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, bring some things out about that, you know, as far as narcissistic people. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, it just, just, just so happens that, uh, you know, some of my previous work experience, um, deals with this book, um, uh, deals with, you know, dealing with a lot of people, um, and there's a book called the DSM-4, uh, and the DSM-4 is a uh, di- it's a, a book that deals with the uh, diagnosis of diagnostic of mental disorders or whatever. And one of the m- mental disorders that the DSM-4, which is a, a sociology book, or you know, it's people who study in, um, for the degrees to get counseling and et cetera, et cetera. But the narcissistic personality disorder, um, it says, and I'm reading out of the DSM-4, so thank you for bringing that question up. It says, uh, a a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration and lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. And I'm not going to read them all. But one of them says, has a grandiose sense of self-importance, exaggerates achievements, talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements, is preoccupied, preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, or ideal love, uh, believes that he or she is special, the inability also to experience guilt, um, uh, exploitative, takes advantage of others to their own achievements, to their own ends, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others, uh, haughty, arrogant, etc. Now, when it comes down to people's inability to experience guilt, right, a person like that isn't going to confess sin because they don't ever feel guilty. So we start cataloging and walking through the scriptures with those like Ananias and Sapphira as an example, Uh, some of the Pharisees as an example. Um, We start looking at uh, the brother named Demas who dealt with Paul and had forsaken him. And, you know, different people have brought things to their attention. And when you can't be reproved for anything, man, there's something wrong with you. Something's really, really wrong with you. Some people, no matter how much you corner them into showing book, chapter, verse, offense, spirit of offense, the principle of being offended, they cannot confess that they've done something wrong because they just lack that empathy. They lack that guilt. And what it often actually does is, you know, the scripture says in other texts is, man, it lifts them up to the point it destroys them, totally destroys them. So, yeah, there's uh, quite a few texts that this, that spirit in people, uh, I think in Psalms, it says the man, uh, maybe it's not Psalms, but the uh, the soul is in Habakkuk, I think. The uh, soul that is lifted up in himself is not upright. But, you know, other texts say he resisted the proud and give grace to the humble. But, yeah, if you have an experience, and, and this is whether you're dealing with 
you know, a son and daughter or a couple or, you know, whichever have you, like specifically in relationships, you have to put yourself in a position to, even if you're not wrong, try to assume the posture of being wrong because you can still learn and grow. And I find a lot of times in, in different places, man, like people do not want to experience being wrong. Like, it's crazy. Like, if you don't experience being wrong, then technically you can't grow, you know? So it's really, really crazy that I come across that. Any more uh, thoughts or questions? Yeah, we have a uh, social media. Let me see. How does one recognize hidden carnal characters or mindsets in people close to us? Usually it would take years before someone can truly recognize it, but it's normal. normally too late. Oh, man, that's a deep question. Um, I would definitely say listen. I would definitely say listen. Uh, and I would definitely say uh, that people should be cautious. Um, and when I say listen, I mean, sometimes, and this is just what I've seen through the years, right? So, if you start getting into the scriptures and you start divorcing yourselves from holidays and this, that, and the third, and, you know, you do always say your mother, your aunt, or your grandmother, and say, look, man, you know, you should be over here for whatever, Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays, whatever pagan stuff people get into. And let's say they all into that. And then you denounce your parents, but then your parents come around your church or religious environment and say, look, young lady or young man, I get that you ain't trying to deal with these holidays I deal with, but something wrong with the people over there that you're dealing with. And because someone's unwilling to listen, they're so blinded, they really can't see it, right? Because I've seen a lot of people who profess to be teachers and the power and the, the arrogance of text lift them up where they know a couple of verses, they memorize, you know, and again, you can memorize enough text that you're saying, you're like, righteous, right? So, look, man, this brother can quote 12 Bible verses back to back to back, or this sister can do such and such. But the reality is, is when you deal with them beyond the letter of it, the spirit of it, they kernel. And you can see it in their responses, how they lash out at people. It's about listening. It's about observing. I think that's really paramount. Also, prayer, fasting. Uh, but I think there's a there's a dividing line from being so spiritual that can't deal with anybody else because you think they're going to be doing something. Uh, and then so open that you're letting anybody tell you anything. I mean, I can't even tell you the amount of people that I came in this thing with who got baptized around the same time that I got baptized who would have led a bunch of women astray. And, again, there's no complete way that I can say, but you got to just take your time pray fast and watch their works. And I, the last thing I'll say on that is think about it like this, if this is applicable. Judas cast out devils too. He did. I mean, he's walking around with some people, et cetera, and too. And let's say that that was going on for a couple of years. But, yeah, it does take time. So, you know, through praying, fasting, and probably don't put yourself out there too much. So if somebody's telling you something and they're rushing you into it, like, hey, you got to lay with me, or hey, you got to uh, give me a car, or let your kids stay at my house. Well, man, we just we just kind of get into it. Let's ease into, you know, what we're doing. And, uh, you know, there's no rush if we're going to do this right. There's yeah, really no rush like that. So I hope that answers. Because there's a couple of texts I kind of jump out of my head, but I have to think through them. Um, any more callers or thoughts? Uh, I've got a couple more scriptures I can go through afterwards, but any more? Yeah, we got people standing by checking out the show again. Today's show is entitled The Camouflage of Sin. For those who joined in, The Camouflage of Sin and Confessions of Iniquity. That number once again, 319-527-6239. My special guest is Brother Moses. And, uh, you know, definitely uh, email your questions or you can call in right now. Press number one and we'll add you in the conversation. Call in via phone, call in via Skype. But we appreciate all the listeners out there that's checking out the show. Uh, at this time, nobody else is pressing number one, so you can bring out whatever else you wanted to bring out, and we'll go back to the phone lines. Cool. Yeah, so I'll pick it up um, in Isaiah chapter 47. Um, Isaiah chapter 47, 
So then again, we're talking about the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. And generally, what the carnal mind does is when they find something that uh, that they have found themselves in that's opposite of what the Creator asks of them or what they decide to do, their first instinct or their first reaction is to hide themselves, right, and hide the sin that they have done. So we've seen it when we looked in Genesis with Adam uh, and his wife. We've seen it with Cain. Uh, we saw it with David. Uh, we saw it with Moses. Uh, and the, and this, the account goes on and on and on. So anytime and it, it happens so frequently in the scriptures that, you know, somebody pull a wool off and say, hey, you busted, you did X, Y, and Z. First thing people doing is hiding. So we gave different examples of that. Again, just talking about how people camouflage or they disguise or they try, they try to deceive uh, the sin that they have gotten themselves into. So we went through some text on that. In Isaiah chapter 47, uh, and I'm picking it up at verse 2, um, talking about the daughter of Babylon, and et cetera, and then I'm not getting into the exact text and all of the, de- the definitions of what it's expressing, but just some points I wanted to make in there. It says, take the millstone and grind mill." Uncover thy locks and make bare thy leg, and uncover thy thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. And then he gets into a couple other thoughts. So again, any time that the text is dealing with the person's nakedness, nakedness is used in a lot of different uh, methods or 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 ways in the Bible, right? So people went out to spy the nakedness of the land. You shall not look and see your father's nakedness or your mother-in-law's nakedness. Uh, uh, you shouldn't be, I think Revelation would say, you know, that you should be uh, have your garments on and not be called naked and be ashamed, etc. But the point being here is that the creator was expressing that what he was going to do to Babylon and the people of Babylon was he was going to discover their nakedness. And how do you discover the nakedness of a nation of people? You really begin to start with the government officials and say, hey, man, these are the things that they were up to in secret. So what we often don't see all the time is the atrocities that happen beyond the personal level. So we looked at a lot of things just you know on, on the people, people level. But and the... the um, maybe the book of Ephesians, I'll say, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I forget what that text is. But it says rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, right? How are those things uncovered? Like, because I've worked in government for a number of years, you begin to see how they parade around different things. And I'll give an example because I like examples. So wherever you live at, whoever's listening, wherever you live at, you may see new developments going up in your community. And you'll get a government official get on TV and cut ribbons and they parade around these things and say, you know, we build an affordable housing. Well, I'll give you a clearer way that we can pull the covers off of what they term affordable. In the D.C. metropolitan area, the average household income is $121,000. Again, in this metro area, the average household income is $121,000. You can Google that. D.C. proper, meaning just in D.C., I think it's about $96,000. So the average households make about $96,000. The poorest people who live in D.C. barely make three to $400 a year. Okay? So the people who are in most need of housing barely make enough money on a yearly basis. So maybe they're making less than a thousand dollars a year and you scrapping up money from here and there or you're on disability or you uh your grandmother getting social services or some type of food stamps or welfare. But then you'll get a lot of public officials who stand up and say, We're building affordable housing. Well, if you calculate what they call the area median income, which is the AMI and a developer comes in and build a property percent or 60% of the AMI, the area of median income, that means you need to make $60,000 to live in that property. 
A lot of people don't make $20,000 or $10,000. So you have a lot of public officials camouflaging the fact that they're not actually doing anything for the people at all. But they conceal it under the term affordable housing. Affordable for who? So if you don't make enough money, then it's not for you. So you have all of these people who are disenfranchised by seeing things built in the community, and then the politicians who get up camouflaging the terminology using what they call double speak, saying that it's affordable, but if you don't make 60K and you can't pay an application fee of $75, then it's not affordable for you. But they build an affordable housing. And again, that's when you deal with Isaiah and Babylon, what the creator began to say is on a national level, yeah, I'm about to start making y'all naked in front of the people. I'm going to discover y'all secrets unto the people. So the people who are disenfranchised by this, who are affected by this negatively, will know for certain, oh, you're not helping the people. They did the same thing in Rome. They would call it bread and circuses. they get the people a party, let them go watch lions eat people, and, and while the other the robber bands was robbing the people blind. So again, when you start dealing with this confession of iniquity and this camouflaging, it goes on all different levels, on all different levels, the personal level, the people level, the government level. Everybody's, when you look at it at the broader spectrum, everybody's camouflaging something that's happened in society, whether it's supermarkets. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go on into all of the details example, but you look at supermarkets, for example, they spray wax on your apples. They spray pesticides, which is roach spray, on your broccoli. But then they tell you it's all natural. Well, what does it mean? What does that mean to be natural? Because when you watch the TV commercials, they also got the diseases on the commercials that cause blood clots, hemorrhaging, and they got the jazz music playing in the background. But again, trying to camouflage the real problem of what this medicine will do to you. So again, whether it's on a personal level, and even when you deal with Isaiah and when he was pointing out in Babylon, so, man, I'm going to point y'all out. I'm going to discover y'all to the people. And uh, the people are going to know. And this is the way that the people began to be not so disenchanted with the sorcerers uh, and the, the evils that they're doing with the people or to the people that they're being affected by. So I'm giving that example again uh, specifically with the affordable housing for the listeners so they can hear. If you hear that term, Think about what they mean to say affordable. And then the next time you hear it, ask them what are they basing affordability on. Uh, so that was Isaiah that we looked at. I'm going to 1 John chapter 1. Uh, and I'll go through a few more texts. Uh, see if there's any more people who have any thoughts or questions. We're looking again at the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. The camouflage of skin, excuse me, the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. In the process that we as people, uh, even the book says, righteous, righteousness exalted the nation, but, you know, wickedness tear it down or something. So whether you're dealing on a local level or national level or global level, the sins of the people, just, just like it was in Nineveh, need to be confessed. So this is First John 1, and this is uh, verse 8. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, again, the process. So if the people decide, look, hey, man, I messed up. Let me go ahead and confess my sin. Then we will be cleansed from that, no matter what it is, right? Uh, but the, it won't, the cleansing won't come unless the confession comes. And then people getting into, which which tends to happen sometimes, and this is what I'm talking about also on a personal level. Some people say, well, I confess my sin to God, and but I'm not going to tell, you know, nobody in the group. Okay, well, that could sound cool, but I'm going to tell you, let's just say hypothetically speaking, you was running around stealing, and I keep inviting you over my house, but stuff keep it coming up missing. Let's say you messed around a few years ago and touched a little boy or a little girl, 
and you go, oh, well, I'm just not going to tell nobody. No, I think that needs to be known because we got to protect the people that's around. And it becomes really important on how you deal with groups of people when you got people who coming around. Because, again, everybody going to pop out the woodwork saying, hey, man, Yahweh, man, hey, man, God, hey, Sabbath, I, I believe too. And that's when people become a danger to themselves. But here you say, you got to confess. And people decide, well, oh, I'm going to confess to this person and not to that person. Yeah, I've seen that too. And I think that that's kind of cunning. But uh, I think that there's a way that that should be handled. But he says we should confess our sins. And he is just and faithful to forgive. And other texts will say confess your sins one to another. Proverbs chapter 15. There's a few texts I'm going to go through. And then we can open it back up. Uh, see if anybody got any thoughts or questions uh, or elaborations. This is Proverbs chapter 15. Again, dealing with the camouflage of sin and the confession of iniquity. Proverbs chapter 15. I'm reading at verse 1. That might not be my text. Oh, verse 3. Sorry. It says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Why is it one reason that it's meet or profitable or good or encouraging to confess because Yahweh's eyes are in every place. So really, nobody getting away with nothing. In Hebrews chapter 4, the scripture is telling me and telling us that he knoweth and searcheth the intent of the heart. And in the Psalms are going to say, you know, sins is not going to be hid. So the reality is, is that his eyes is everywhere. And I don't take the Almighty to have literal eyes, per se, necessarily, like his own eyes everywhere. But the principle still remains is that he knows what's going on. He's not going to be able to hide nowhere. So it's our job to not only bring out our own iniquity and sin, uh, we find it in others. We should point it out in them and encourage them. And because sometimes you may see something in others that you got questions about. Hey, man, you know, seem like you sometimes do this or act like this or behave like this. Like, you know, maybe somebody is struggling with something and support them through that struggle. Uh, but even on a on a more national, global level, when you see people protesting, when you see people uh, advocating for the rights of certain people in, in profitable and encouraging ways, the bands of wickedness got to be loosed even on the national and uh, global level because a lot of wickedness going on. And I think sometimes people who deal with the scriptures get so much into the personal level that we look at, we fail to look at the national level or the global level and how people are being affected. Because here in the, the Americas, the media does a really, really good job of not knowing that the Haynes underwear and t-shirts that you wear is being manufactured. That's for people who are making $30 American a month. Like they really doing bad over there, but the commercials, man, they make you think you can jump out the gym with them t-shirts and shoes on, but we don't always hear the other parts of the story. This is John chapter 15. And again, we're talking the confession of sin and confess the camouflage of sin and confession of iniquity. John chapter 15, verse 22 uh, John 15 and verse 22 It says If I had not come and spoken unto them They had not had Excuse me They had not had sin But now They have no cloak for their sin He that hates me Hated my father also etc So notice one of the jobs of the prophets Even the Messiah Was to take off The cloak Where hey man they discovered now just like we was reading what happened to Babylon and the Chaldeans, they was discovered. Same thing that happened to Nineveh, they was discovered. Same thing that happened to a lot of other nations, they was discovered. No hiding now. We know y'all over there doing some type of wickedness now. Same thing that happened in the 60s when the brothers and sisters was marching, and nobody really knew what was going on down in Alabama and stuff like that. But when it was well known that people was getting beat, People in California was raising up saying, we got to go down there too. Because when we didn't know that folks was acting like that, because they was now exposed. They was totally exposed. Same thing has happened over in Vietnam. People on a national level, people was totally exposed. Man, I didn't know they was over there killing them people for no reason. But yeah, now it has been uncovered. And that uncovering 
began to say the fault of the Americas and the French and the imperialist powers that was over there trying to destroy people. So, again, whether we're talking on the local level, a personal level, a political level, a national level, people try to camouflage sin. Hey, man, I'm right along with you, man. Hey, man, we helping the people, too. Nah, you ain't helping the people, man. Truth is, you lying in your pockets. We ain't know till we search the books, right? So if the cloak wasn't pulled up, we would have never known. Psalms 90, it talks about the secret sins being healed or, or not being hid. Uh, a couple more texts that I'm going to go through. Uh, and then, again, we'll open it back up. Uh, this is Psalms chapter 85. Let's jump into Psalms 85, a couple more texts. Appreciate anybody who was able to listen in today, and even if you get a chance to catch it on the recording. Uh, this is Psalms chapter 85. Ch- Psalms chapter 85 and verse 3. It says, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. Turn us, O God, our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thy anger Unto all generations. Uh-oh. Show it home. All right, so I don't know where I went to that verse. I was missing something. Oh, verse 2, I think I was looking for. For thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, for thou hast covered their sins. And this is how the captivity of Jacob was turned back. Other texts I'll let you know is because the people confessed their iniquity. This is what he said through the mouth of Solomon. You know, if my people call by the name, humble themselves, they and pray, seek his face, confess their faults, etc. He'll turn the hill of land. So it's a process. If we do not camouflage our sin, whether as an individual, as a family, dealing with our children, dealing with the nation, national level, etc., we don't camouflage it. And also the jobs of the people is to loose the bands of wickedness, to pull off the cloaks of people who hide them. Uh, some brothers who do a really good job of that, they get on, uh, you know, advocating, showing scriptures, debating, uh, contending, because some people are here parading around these false notions. And uh, Brother Sal, when you get the opportunity, I still want to connect with them two sisters, man, because there's two sisters that be on the show sometimes, uh, Mayuna, and I forget the other one name, but, but you know, they bringing out certain Ma- things. Amona. Say, Amona. what's your yep. other one name? Imuna well, and Mayana. Yeah, they do some, yeah, Imuna, I, can't, I always say Mayuna, but I mix them up. Imuna and Mayana. Uh, them two sisters amongst other sisters that I hear doing a really powerful job of empowering the women because what I've seen brothers so-called in the word do over the course of years, they get high on their horse, they know some scriptures, they find some ignorant sisters, uh, they mess around and, and do them over, and now they gone back off into the world because they ain't been treated right and dealt these harsh blows and they blaming the God of Israel. But these sisters amongst other sisters are doing a really, really good job and it's encouraging hearing them when I get the opportunity to listen to them. Like, nah, 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 y'all ain't about to use that scripture that way. We ain't rocking like that. We we academics, we doing some studies, we going to some definitions, and we're going to help empower these young women that they're not taking advantage of. And that's a powerful piece because you got people camouflaging and you got other sisters stepping up saying, look, we're pulling that, off. We pulling that cloak off for y'all too. So now brothers got to hold it a whole different way. So I encourage them sisters, keep up that work. Other sisters, keep up that work. Chase them brothers into the end of the corner using them texting appropriately. Uh, one, of my, one of my long-time <laughs> buddies and former rivals, you know, the jokey manner, Josh, man, he jump on sometimes, jumping on folks. Keep doing the work. Chase people in the corner and pull the cloak off of them. Brother Zadok, get in the court, ch- chase him, pull the cloak off because people are running around using text inappropriately and causing people to be destroyed because of camouflage. And I think that that's really important work to be done. Um, one or two more texts. I'm going to go into the book of Micah, chapter 7, and uh, I'll open the line back up. I think I've talked enough. I generally don't like talking as much. Um Micah chapter 7 and should do like the young boys grab my uh, 
my my electronic one, so I didn't be flipping pages, but I'm old school. Uh, Micah chapter 7, and I'm picking it up at verse uh, 18. And it says, Who is like who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquities and passes by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will, he will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. And he said he will perform this because he sworn to the fathers of Jacob and unto Abraham. So, when we look at the process that the carnal mind goes through, I'm going, I'm again asserting that the carnal mind, the deceitful mind, the evil mind wants to camouflage sin. And if you're dealing with, again, whether we're talking a local level, personal level, personally, people go do something crazy and they hide it. Oh, I didn't do that or they just want to pretend. I gave an example on a, on a local level. I see a lot of politicians and it wasn't until I started working in circles of, you know, government and contractors and construction and real estate developers. Man, these people run around talking about some affordable housing. But they saying affordable is 80K. How many people making 80K? I mean, it, but the people think, oh, man, they building some new affordable housing. But you can't even get a get an application because the application fee is $125. So that's the way that they camouflage and stuff. And you deal with it on the national level or even the international level. People are running around camouflaging things, and it's the job of the people who are doing the work to pull and uncover the skirts of their wickedness. So I'm going to pause there, see if anybody have any more thoughts, questions, or concerns. Again, for the brother, Sal, I appreciate you opening up the uh, opportunity. Uh, yep, but I'll open the line up and see if anybody got any more thoughts, questions, or concerns. All right, family, once again, we open up the phone lines as usual. Uh, if you're listening on social media, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. Once you call in, you got to simply press number one, and uh, we'll add you in the conversation. Or you can email me your questions at debatetalkview at gmail.com. By the way, folks, if you missed yesterday's show, we have a show called Under the Palm Hebrew Women Speak. Uh, they spoke about that movie, uh, The Black Panther, and there was a lot of uh, you know controversy between yesterday's show. Well. Some of the brothers want to speak about the show, uh, that movie, actually, The Black Panther. And that's going to actually happen uh, Friday, March 30th. We're going to have brothers like Ron Devon Prospect, uh, Brother Josh, Zadok, Robert Reed, Mikael Ben Israel, and I believe one more individual is going to be here speaking about that particular movie. And uh, actually, the title of that show is, uh, and if you watch the movie, you'll understand the title, T'Challa vs. Killmonger, Who Was Right? <laughs> so make sure you tune in uh, Friday. Uh, that's going to be March 30th. So the ladies had their uh, spoke spoke about it. I and mean, if you missed it, go check it out in the archives. You know, you can go to YouTube, iTunes, in the podcast section, or Blog Talk Radio, and check out yesterday's show. And uh, we're going to have the show for the for the fellas speaking about this movie, uh, The Black Panther. Make sure you tune in and find out what's going to be said. Um, yeah, man. Nobody else is pressing number one at this time, brother Moses. So I guess if you want to bring out some last words, you can do so now. Go ahead. Uh, I think I'm good. I think I kind of covered some of the content I wanted to cover, and uh, I think I'm I'm fine. I think uh, it. I guess you know my wife texting her. If anybody, I don't know if anybody would you know want to say this, but has anybody ever had the experience of confessing uh, something, and you know what happened as a result of it? Uh, if, if you know somebody would share something like that, and what was what result did it yield? Um, but again, I don't know if anybody wanted to share something like that. Yeah, we got a lot of people on the phone lines, but yeah, nobody pressing number one, man, at this time. But you know, sometimes you go on the YouTube page. <laughs> you go on the YouTube page, and there's a lot of comments on the YouTube page. You know, after the fact. So, you know, hopefully just go to the YouTube page and we'll see what's been said. But, again, I appreciate you, Brother Moses, for coming out, bringing this information to camouflage of sin. So, in a nutshell, pretty much is saying, you know, whatever you do behind the scenes, bring it out, <laughs> pretty much, because it's going to come out anyway. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Oh, definitely going to come out. Yeah, at some point or another, it's definitely going to come out anyway. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I think sometimes just in the course, it's probably easier not to be embarrassed because the thing about when things do come out, 
you really never know when or how, right? And I don't think people like that because that's a whole other thing when you feel embarrassed about a thing. And, you know, hey, man, we in the middle of doing whatever else. And, you know, there's an example of a particular individual I'm aware of who, yeah, you know, hey, man, you know, just coming along like everybody else or you would think, right? And then, lo and behold, somebody come and kind of find out he was dealing with something that uh, he was dealing with somebody besides the somebody who blew the cover and was like, whoa, man, he out here sleeping with this person, that person, and they, they were, I guess, doing it because they were mad, you know, but it was helpful. I was like, oh, man, this person over here, man, acting crazy. But who knew, you know? So it took somebody being jealous and angry but not a person embarrassed. Like, whoa, man, <laughs> why'd you come telling them? Because nobody, you know, it wasn't somebody that was in a normal circuit. So it's just interesting when it comes out. Uh, so sometimes I just think it's better that the people bring it out themselves. If yeah, hold on, Brother Moses. Hold on. Wonderful. We got somebody pressing number one right now. Also, somebody saying uh, uh, sometimes when you say too much, <laughs> it can also hurt your reputation as well. Some of these people out there that say too much about themselves, <laughs> and it also can hurt them as well. Yeah. What do you say to that before we go to the yeah. next call? Yeah, we do have a caller standing by, but you can make a comment on that one. Yeah. That. I, I, I think that that has to be seasoned with salt. Um, and when I say seasoned with salt, like, there's some things that I did in the world that when I left that, no, I don't necessarily need to go into no long diatribe on all of the things I did and how long I was doing them. And, because some people may not recover from that. And I think, you know, one thing that I think maybe Paul or Peter was saying is that some things you deal with, and he's, he's really talking about the, the scriptures, but some things you expound on those with those who are perfect or those who understand more. But you got some people who, again, like, you know, you come telling me that you was doing some more wild, crazy stuff, like, I don't know, whatever you're doing out there, I probably don't want you at my house, you know. Like, I got to I gotta wait for a while to see if you really cling to that spirit before you start coming around me. And, you know, I'll catalog this example in, like, male-female relationships, but you get a new sister coming around the ministry, and she's telling all the sisters that she used to be involved in whatever, you know, leave it to the imagination, and you know, oh, can your husband drop me off at home? Like, whoa, everybody going to have a problem with that. Now, because you put so much out there, which could be good, uh, good that you put it out there so people know, but people are going to react a certain way. And now you may feel a certain Well, people don't trust me. Well, yeah, man, you said you was out there doing whatever. Uh, they probably have a reason not to trust you. Same thing with a man who was like, yeah, man, I used to man, be a huge adulterer. Oh, yeah, man, no, you can't come over to my house when I'm not home. Like, that, that that would be a problem, right? So, again, I think it's, it does, it is a balance. Uh, some people do say too much too soon, and you really just want to work that former spirit out of you and make sure that that's gone out of you, in my estimation. Make sure it's gone out of you and make sure that even if it's people you're telling, like, you're doing it responsibly. Not just freaking scaring people. It's, my goodness. Don't tell me you was doing seances and then you asked me, can you spend a night or spend a weekend? <laughs> and watch? No, that's... No. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, yeah, you know, that's a no-no. That's a no-no right there. Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see we got people actually on social media saying great show. They're loving the content. We appreciate your family on Facebook. We appreciate you. But we do have somebody pressing number one, standing by. But before we go to that person, I see uh, Doris is still standing by. Let me see if she has any further questions. 716, anything else you want to say? Um, I think, you know, sometimes when you don't get a lot of callers, they're actually really enjoying the content, you know, and that's basically what I was doing and enjoying the content. Um, yeah. Yeah, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. That's right. Sometimes the message is just straightforward. It is what it is. You know, there's no way around it. You know, bam, it's in your face. <laughs> and it's right there, you know. That's it. But uh, let's go to the next call. Let's go to 719-8534. You're live in there. Seven one nine five three four. Can you hear me? Oh, snap. I had the mute on. 
I'm sorry. Shalom, everybody. What's, what's good, Elder Moses? I'm so happy to hear you teach again. It has been too Ooh. long. <laughs> it has been too long. Man, it, it takes me back to the days in D.C. Oh, man. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I echo what the last caller was saying. I was listening and just enjoying the content. But I wanted to uh, go ahead and push the number one and just let you know I was listening. I did also have a question. Um, you had uh, you were talking about how I guess this this kind of idea of like when your conscience is pricked and not everybody you, you were talking about you know you need to train your conscience. And so my question is what um, like how do you kind of go about that when you are maybe dealing with somebody who is like, because, you know, in, uh, influence is also a thing. So when somebody who maybe their conscience isn't pricked about something, but yours is, like how how do you go about that? I mean, I know like, at the end of the day you should just be able to kind of resist that, that, um, that kind of influence, but it's still like, especially if it's a close relationship or if you're dealing with somebody in the community, um, whether it's, you know, whatever type of relationship it is, <clears throat> and, you know, you still have to deal with that person, but then you feel how you feel. I guess my question is, like, if your conscience is pricked but somebody else's isn't, you can do your part in, in training your own conscience and resisting, I guess, peer pressure or whatever it would be deemed, whatever influence of that spirit. But how would you kind of go about dealing with that person um, if they're kind of continuing and, well, you know, I'm not kind of convicted by this or it doesn't bother me type of situation yeah I think it's it's interesting so one of the things I think is that the things that don't tend to bother people in my estimation is things that maybe maybe that person has not really kind of examined for themselves for it to potentially bother them so the person who celebrates Christmas or eats swine or whatever have you, man, man, I don't think nothing wrong with that, right? Man, God, I don't got no problem with that. Why? Because they never actually looked into if he would have a problem with that. So I think the first defense is, okay, well, if this does not bother you, but it bothers me, then to me that's a sign, right? And I'm saying that this is just the way my brain operates, if you believe the scripture, and let's say, for example, you may be a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness or a Catholic or something, whatever you would be, but you believe the Bible to whatever text you believe, whatever, and you bring out something to me that bothers you because you believe it, then I'm going to take the liberty to look into it. That's me as a student. Because I'm like, whoa, man, man if, if this person really serious about that, then let me look and see if then I should be serious about that. And I think that that's what a good student and believer would do. So I think that that's the first thing, right? If you're really serious about it, then let's actually look into it. So some people, and I don't personally or biblically believe, but I don't eat at like McDonald's, right? I haven't ate at McDonald's since you know, probably 10, 15 years, at least 15 years or better, right? So the next person say, man, ain't nothing wrong with that, man. Well, see, I used to work there when I was a kid, okay? So I know what the law say about uh, if something unclean cooked on the grill, and I know the same breakfast patties that we cooked on that McDonald's with swine grill is the same where they cook the hamburgers on. And there, there's no overnight period. and ain't no breaking down. And beyond the other nasty, disastrous dietary stuff that McDonald's does. But for the next person... They're not looking that deep into it. Man, God ain't worried about all of that. Because let's sit down and look at it closely enough because that is how you form that convictive conscience. It's the same way you form muscles. I think that you've got to go put energy into forming a muscle. And if you don't do that, then it's not going to be there. And I, I'm I'm frightened by people who don't do that because there's nothing – to resist them from doing different types of things. So again, like, and this is probably, you know, a broader example, but I was at a poetry reading 
a couple weeks ago, uh, and a guy got up and quoted Leviticus 19, and thou shalt not lay with man as he lay with Thou shall not man shall not lay with man as he lay with woman, and he was talking about how he was made to feel shame and less than because of the way he is, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then he began to talk about the Catholic priests and a bunch of other people who did some type of sin. And well, what about them? Well, to me, first of all, why are you comparing yourself to a pedophile, right? So something got to be wrong with the activity that you're doing to make a comparison like that. But the same person who would say it's okay to do that would probably have a a problem with a person sleeping with an animal. That's in the same text. The same man who would say the law is done away with would agree that you shouldn't lay with a woman on her menstrual cycle. But the next man will say, look, man, I don't got no problem with doing nothing like that. Well, okay, well, you got to have a convicted conscience. Let's redo this, man. Why Why shouldn't this be done? And if you can look at it for yourself and the people who may not be convinced, like just keep let's keep examining it. Let's dig deeper without, you know, doing a tennis match back and forth, but let's just look a little deeper. Let's see if this is something that we should not do. Because the next person I'm like, you know, it's okay, man. It's okay to eat at this place and that place and there's no depth of study to that person. That's my estimation. So I think the way that you do it is, man, we got to be convinced of this together. And let's let's look at it deeper to see what these texts are saying. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. And that, that was kind of what I was thinking, um, uh, kind of after what you said about kind of training your conscience, like really in my mind. I, I had a, At first I was like, what does that mean? But then you gave the example of how, you and the other elders, you know, back in the day used to scare yourselves into not doing, you know, things. And that's, you did that by going through the scriptures. So I was like, okay, yeah, pretty straightforward. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think it but, works. But yeah. And that, uh, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say I appreciate you um, Doing the study, I think that it's, it's very, very important. And sin, I don't think is really, or the way people deal with sin, I haven't really seen too many teachings on it in this this uh, detail, this kind of detail. And I think that it's really, it is really important, though, so that people can know how to deal with it. And also, um, because, you know, sin is what got us in this mess in the first place. And like you have read um, when Solomon was blessed in the temple, if we will confess our sins and pray like the Lord will, will forgive us. So I think it's important and I just, uh, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll yeah, teach I you that in three years for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <so> everything <laughs> is going to be that? a lesson, huh? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I'll teach you that in three years for you. <laughs> joking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Brother Moses got those, uh, Annual lessons, you know, it. <laughs> annual lessons, you know. Well, but, uh, I think I yeah. taught every week for about five or six years, so I said I'm going to take a little hiatus. I got mm. to examine a couple mm. of things, and I got a couple other projects I'm working on, getting wrapped up. So yeah. I'll be back at it and probably do a little, little more public stuff. Yeah, man, we appreciate you, man. All right, well, again, nobody's is pressing number one. Uh, for those people that might have been moved by this lesson, and, uh, you know, they want to reach out to you. Is there any information you want to bring out right now? Uh, let the audience know. Or if not, we can pretty much wrap it up. Yeah, I think I'm all good. Uh, I don't know. I kind of put my wife website on hiatus. Um, but uh, boy, everything else is like a business email address. But uh, I don't know. Email Sal. He'll give you a number inbox. And he'll give you my number to reach out. But uh yeah, encouragement to all the people who was able to listen in and even those who listen in later. Uh, just kind of use it as a mechanism of dealing with people in your environment and even the broader picture that we looked at, too. So, yeah, appreciate the opening.